Welcome to QD Clinic. Hi, I'm Jack Cushwood. Room now. QD Clinic is brought to you by PSA All the Way. Our April campaign focused solely on psoriatic arthritis. Usually, QD Clinic is about lessons from the clinic. This week, QD Clinic is questions from Room Now Live 2022. Today, questions from the rheumatoid arthritis session. We had two of them, chock full of questions. First. What's the best way to improve adherence in RA patients, in all patients for that matter? And I think it really begins and ends with you and trust. In my session where I talked about um, refractory or difficult to treat RA, I talked about shared decision making and that that's the beginning of patient success because that's the beginning of patient trust. It's not easy. It requires you to get out of your usual rhythm uh, and flow and spend more time listening and letting the patient talk. But again, it is about your getting trust. That's like, I think, the single best tool. Uh, Education is a way of overcoming that. That's part of shared decision making, using patient decision aids and whatnot. But I think, uh, again, it really is the trust factor, which means your ability to impart urgency and need for continuing medicine becomes more effective the more you treat the patient not so much on the first visit more on the fourth and the 11th visit so again the sooner you do those things that gain that trust the better off you're going to be second is anyone uh, using the prism ra test and do they find it very uh, valuable Um, it's commercially available it's fda approved some people are using it i would never use it Why? Because it's, one, not a biomarker. Two, it is a test that is designed to make you about 30, 40% smarter in your decision-making, meaning if they have the molecular signature in the test, then you shouldn't use a TNF inhibitor. And that makes you, again, 30 to 40% brighter. I've talked during my session about just using um, things like seropositivity, especially in early disease or first DMARD patients, where your odds of getting a better response in seropositive patients using certain drugs goes up 10 to 20%. On the other hand, you could use this test, which tells you when not to do certain things. Gee, that sounds like my mother. Um, And what's the workflow on that? You want to start a TNF inhibitor. You're going to order the test. The test gets ordered. The test goes to their billing people. They submit a claim. They tell the patients that this could cost as much as $125. You're going to get an answer back in two weeks, three weeks. How long? In the meantime, the patient could have been on a TNF inhibitor that you could have started right away. You're going to know if you're going to hit a home run on a TNF inhibitor really in the first four weeks first two or three injections. You're not looking for a base hit. You're looking for home runs. I I would never use this. It's it's expensive. It's needless. I'm doing quite well without it. What's your best clue for differentiating between seronegative RA and CPPD in someone who has persistent MCP synovitis? Well, clearly, serologies would help. Radiographic appearance of a typical uh, RA erosions would help. But the radiographic appearance is really distinctive for CPPD. And your only choices here are either tap the joint, get a synovial biopsy, get the synovial fluid, do um, micro, uh, uh, crystal identification, or x-rays. And x-rays are the way to go. Um, conventional x-ray is as useful, um, actually more useful, than is MRI. And there you're looking for pericapsular calcification, hook osteophytes. Um, there are very distinctive findings. The x-ray appearance of the MCP between CPPD and RA are very different. Talk to your radiologist and you'll see what he says. Tim Lonsky asks about, in my seronegatives, and trying to further distinguish what they are, he, he, and I, I, I like his approach, he orders uh, 14338. What's What's my perspective on that? I will sometimes do that as well. When 1433 ADA came out, a test that's got the same kind of characteristics as does CCP and um, maybe CCP more than RA, meaning that it's sort of specific. Um, it um, It is associated, found earlier in, in the disease process. It, it does associate with a radiographic risk. 
um, and whatnot. So I started ordering a lot of um, newly diagnosed patients, RF, CCP, and 1433 ADA. You could throw into that mix anti-carbamylated P antibodies, not usually commercially available. And the question is, how much better will you do if you do a 1433 ADA or anti-carb P to your usual profile? And the answer is not much. So I have found it to be minimally additive in my understanding of seronegative patients. I may do it in patients I'm puzzled by with seronegative disease. I gotta move fast. Refractory RA with exudative effusions. Any recommendations? Yeah, exudative effusions are due to cancer, 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 infection, infection, infection. And then way down on the list, I mean like that's 50 plus percent cancer, 20, 30% infection, and like 3% RA, or an autoimmune disease, a connective tissue disease, if you will. So I would wear, I would go after synovial tissue, get a synovial biopsy. Um, obviously, you've done synovial fluid analyses, but they aren't good at making it cancer or an infection diagnosis. You need biopsy. You need to get pulmonary involved. How long do you keep a patient on cyclosporin, and do I use it in combination with methotrexate? Almost always in combination with methotrexate. Um, uh, I have patients who've been on methotrexate and cyclosporin for a long time. I mean, like three, four, five years. And that's just due to vigilance on dosing. I start out at about three milligrams per kilogram. I go no higher than five milligrams per kilogram. I watch blood pressure and creatinine like a hawk. I tell the patient what their, their stop dead creatinine level is. And again, you have to keep it within 30% of baseline. So if your baseline creatinine is 1.0, it can go no higher than 1.3. Once you start seeing high blood pressure and creatinine's creeping up, that's the beginning of the end on cyclosporin. Um, side effects with long dose steroids at 2.5 milligrams a day. Again, I pointed out the two papers that showed higher cardiac events, higher hospitalizable serious infections, even at one, two, and three milligrams per day. We, you can talk yourself into thinking 2.5 is safe for a long period of time. The data um, says that that's not absolutely true. Yes, there are some people who can get away with it, but not many. Um, can um, you get better uh, insight into RA using synovial fluid molecular analyses compared to synovial biopsy analyses? And I think that I, most of my early career was spent on looking at this. And the bottom line is synovial fluid doesn't really reflect what's always going on in the synovium. Uh, and therefore, uh, there are no studies showing predictive um, profiling as was shown in, this, uh, in that session um, that we had um, by using synovial fluid analyses. Sorry. And then lastly, does using Rayos have any benefit um, if you're using steroids? And again, I never use Rayos. I never use Actar. I mean, they are expensive steroids. You know why they have utility? Because the people who make them make money on a drug that's dirt cheap. There's no proven value to them. I would never use them. Tune in for more questions from Room Now Live 2022.